Welcome back, middle schoolers. We are wrapping up our semester on the sacraments. So this whole semester, we've been focusing on how the sacraments are a visible sign of an invisible reality, and that every sacrament communicates God's love and God's grace to us. Every sacrament aids us in our journey towards heaven, our journey towards holiness. So we started off our semester talking about the sacraments of initiation, which bring us into God's life and bring us into God's family. They strengthen us in our faith, strengthen us in our relationship with God, and they give us the nourishment uh, to sustain us through the Eucharist. So we have the three sacraments of initiation, baptism, confirmation, and Holy Eucharist. And then we talked about the sacraments of healing, that the sacraments of healing are meant to heal us uh, physically or spiritually. We have the sacrament of reconciliation, which is uh, meant to uh, give us the grace to overcome sin, uh, gives us forgiveness of sins through that sacrament um, as we continue to grow in holiness. And then we have the sacrament of anointing of the sick, which is meant to aid us physically, knowing that we are both bodies and souls and that God cares about our bodies as well. So given either for the purpose of, of healing, um, when one faces disease, when one faces injury, um, or for strengthening when nearing death. And then we started talking about the sacraments at the service of communion. These sacraments are geared towards vocation. And not every vocation is a sacrament. Every, not every vocation has a sacrament uh, expressly associated with it. But two vocations are raised to the level of a sacrament uh, because they are, are so special. And we previously talked about holy orders, the sacrament by which a man receive the, receives the graces and the authority to become a deacon, a priest, or a bishop. And then lastly tonight, um, today, coming to the sacrament of holy matrimony. So as we start to look at the sacrament of holy matrimony, it's good to look to creation. We know that in the story of creation, God creates humanity male and female, that both man and woman are a reflection of God. And they're created for each other. They're not created randomly. They're created in such a way that they find um, wholeness, they find um, completion with one another. So God knew that it was not good for man to be alone. So God creates a woman as a complement to man. That man and woman are meant to live in harmony. They're created to give each other fully to themselves. They're created for union with one another. They're created for a partnership for life for their own benefit and for the glory of God, recognizing again that, that man and woman both are a reflection of God and together they uniquely reflect God. Through marriage, they're called to bring uh, children into the world and they're called to care for creation, called to be a gift, um, gift of themselves. So this is part of God's original plan. Marriage is not a human institution but it is seen through natural law, it is seen through um, the very basics of creation. But we know that things aren't perfect, that man and woman do not remain in perfect harmony with one another, that when sin enters the world, sin destroys harmony, uh, destroys harmony interiorly with oneself, destroys harmony that humanity has with nature, that humanity has with God, and the harmony that exists between humans, between men and women even, distorting um, and breaking away at the perfect union God intended. But God, of course, does not want men and women, men, men and women to live in this tension, to live in this brokenness of relationship. Through the grace of the sacrament of matrimony, God gives men and women, again, the grace uh, to live as God originally intends. And we see this brokenness that exists even from the very beginning of the fall, that right after humanity falls into sin, they eat the, tr uh, eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What's the first thing that happens when God asks them what happened? Adam immediately places blame on his bride, places blame on Eve. The woman you put here made me eat the fruit. So instead of taking responsibility for his own actions, the blame is shifted on the woman and even on God. That distortion enters the relationship right away. But God is uh, 
ever generous in his grace, ever generous in his blessings to us. And through the person of Jesus institutes the sacrament of holy matrimony, that God through the sacrament gives men and women the grace to heal these wounds caused by sin, gives them the grace to, to live peacefully, live harmoniously with one another, so much so that their union has the potential to be fruitful, uh, specifically in the bearing of children, um, or possibly fruitful in other ways, such as through adopting of children, um, being a life-giving presence to their extended families, to their communities. When a man and woman enter into the sacrament of holy matrimony, they express that they are in this till death do us part. The vows of marriage, the bonds of marriage, last until one of the members of that marriage dies. So again, marriage is a divine institution, is not a human institution, that um, human persons don't get to choose when they um, leave that bond of marriage, that only death ends that bond of marriage. Marriage is indissoluble. Once, uh, once a couple gets married, they are to remain married. Um, and even if they do, uh, do choose to get divorced, um, in the eyes of God, in the eyes of the church, they are still married. Uh, there's something called an annulment, uh, which maybe you've heard before, is a term that ex um, seeks to um, express that a marriage hasn't actually taken place. Um, so sometimes you'll hear couples who um, have been married um, will seek an annulment. Uh, this is not a Catholic divorce. But it's a way of saying, well, actually, a, a valid marriage didn't actually occur between uh, this couple. But that's that's a topic for another day. Marriage isn't always easy, but Jesus gives us the strength to, to remain steadfast and committed to those bonds of marriage. Marriage is a covenant. Uh, sometimes we're familiar with the term contract, and we think a contract is kind of like a covenant. We're... A contract is an exchange of goods and services. A covenant is an exchange of persons. So marriage, the husband and wife are exchanging them their very selves. Which is very beautiful um, in the sight of God and in the sight of the church. Marriage is also a reflection of both the, uh, the Trinitarian love of God and marriage is a reflection of the love of Christ um, and the church. So marriage as a model of Trinitarian love. If we look to the Holy Trinity, God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there's something really beautiful that is communicated um, in that exchange of love in the Trinity that is then reflected in marriage. So in the Trinity, God the Father loves the Son so totally, so fully. God the Son receives the Father's love and then returns the Father's love so fully, so totally, that their love, their outpouring of love is its own person, is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Holy Trinity. In the sacrament of holy matrimony, a husband loves his wife so fully, so totally. A wife receives her husband's love and returns that love so fully, so totally, that their love, their exchange of love has the potential of bringing forth new life. So much so that after generally nine months, you give it a name. They have a child, uh, which is a beautiful reflection of the love of God. And then uh, holy matrimony, marriage is also meant to be a reflection of the love that Christ has for the church. So Christ loves the church so fully, so totally that he gives his very life, gives his very being out of love for his bride, the church. This is one of the most beautiful analogies that we have for Christ in the church is this... Um, image of, of bridegroom and bride. The church then receives the love of Christ and seeks to live, um, live in communion with Christ. Similarly, in a marriage, a husband should love his wife like Christ loved the church, uh, love her so totally, sacrifice for her, lay down his very life for the good of his bride, for the holiness of his bride. And his bride should then seek to um, live in communion with her husband. Um, sometimes we talk about this passage from Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5, 
um, this idea of of um, be subordinate to one another, be submissive to one another out of love for Christ. And a lot of times people hear those words and they immediately get turned off. But to be submissive to one another out of Christ, especially when it's used as wives be submissive to your husbands, is really meant to say to be under the same mission as your husband. Be under the same mission as one another. So husbands, love your wives to the point of death. Love your wives to the point of total sacrifice for her out of love. And wives, place yourself under the mission of your husband. Be a cohesive team, a cohesive partnership. Moving on to the sacrament itself. The sacrament of matrimony is unique because in the sacrament of matrimony, the couple are the ministers. So normally when we talk about any other sacrament, uh, the ministers almost always, with rare exceptions, um, in the case of baptism, a... Um, an ordained man, so priest most ordinarily, or possibly deacon or bishop depending on the sacrament. The priest is just present at the sacrament of uh, marriage, sacrament of holy matrimony, to bless the marriage and to witness the vows. The couples exchange vows promising their, their lifelong commitment to one another in the eyes of God, and rings are generally used as um, a signifier of these vows. The sacrament of holy matrimony between two baptized Catholics uh, generally takes place in the context of the Mass because, again, uh, what beautiful way to, to sustain a marriage than through uh, the Mass, through the Holy Eucharist. And uh, the celebration of marriage, of holy matrimony between uh, two Catholics, as understood as a sacrament, um, should always take place in a church. There are rare exceptions where it's... It can be allowed for the sacrament to take place outside the church, but the church is always the proper context for the sacrament of holy matrimony. In the sacrament of holy matrimony, Jesus gives the couple, again, the grace to, to live the Father's original plan, uh, to, to strengthen their bond, to give them grace in times of need. Um, and then through the sacrament, they are bonded to one another for life. This bond, this grace helps them with all the, the duties to which they're called. It helps them to live through the highs and lows of this vocation because marriage is not a walk in the park. Marriage has challenges, has peaks and valleys. And then when the spouses give their consent to be married before God, the marriage is sealed by God. The bond cannot be broken um, by, um, by the couple. Even if they choose to separate, even if they choose to divorce, they still are married um, in the eyes of God and in the eyes of the church. Marriage is not easy, but the good news is that it's not just merely an in human institution. If it were merely a human institution, then yes, it would be bound to fail a thousand times over. But those couples who enter into marriage, who um, seek God's grace through the sacrament of holy matrimony, are given the grace um, even when times are difficult. There's a lot of ways that marriage has been has been broken, has been misrepresented um, in our current world and current culture. Um, but remembering that God Himself is the author of marriage, no one can under no one can change the definition of marriage. No one can um, change what marriage is to suit their own means um, or their own desires. And just a note on this too: that if a couple uh, does choose to get divorced. Um, even though divorce isn't recognized in the eyes of God, in the eyes of the church, remember that God still loves those people. Uh, those people are still um, wanted by God, still loved by God. Uh, they're not bad people. So they're still people to be loved and respected and cared for and are still part of the church. So as we wrap up, we should also look at what does marital love look like? What are some of the qualities of love in a marriage, or should be the qualities of love in the mar love in marriage? And there are four main uh, qualities of marital love. That marital love is free, total, faithful, and fruitful. So what do these mean? If we say that marital love is free, that means the couple enters into marriage freely. They're not being coerced into this marriage. They're not being forced into this marriage. There's no pressure for them to enter into this bond, to enter into this union. Um, so if you know one of their parents is forcing them to get married, 
um, or if one um, member of the couple saying either you get married to me or we break up, that wouldn't be a free, um, free commitment. That wouldn't be um, full consent to enter into that marriage bond. Secondly, that marital love is total. So in marriage, husbands and wives share everything with one another, give of themselves totally to one another. And this can take a number of different forms um, to varying degrees. Um, so they, they give themselves everything in terms of, of resources and finances, that they are a joint team. So um, in a Catholic understanding of marriage, there's not this idea of, well, I have my bank account over here and he has his bank account over here, and we kind of live these separate financial lives. That really wouldn't be living marital love totally. Um, or one of our middle schoolers brought up a good point last night in that um, in a marriage to give each, to each other totally means that there's no secrets. We keep nothing from one another. We are totally honest with one another. We share everything with one another. And another thing that um, comes into giving to each other totally is we give our fertility totally. We don't hold back our fertility from one another um, to say that I want you, I want your body, but I don't want children with you, um, at least not at this time. Uh, we give, give to one another totally in that capacity as well. And then thirdly, marital love is faithful. And this one kind of goes without saying, but when we enter into marriage to say to that other person, you are the only person for me. I will be faithful to you in good times and in bad, in sickness and health, for richer, for poorer, till death parts us. That I'm not going off seeking a relationship with someone else when I'm bored with you, when I fall out of love with you, um, when times are hard. Um, that I'm going to be faithful to you until one of us dies. And that's a big commitment. And then fourthly, that marital love is fruitful. And when we talk about fruitful, the first thing that we're talking about explicitly here is that marital love is geared towards the bearing and the raising of children. So couples um, are prohibited from doing anything that would prevent them, um, prohibit them from bearing children. So uh, marital love needs to have the possibility of bringing forth new life. Now you might say, what about couples that can't have children? Um, maybe for reasons of biology, maybe for reasons of age. Um, there, there are other avenues that the couple can pursue, such as adoption, foster care. Um, and even then, if, if those avenues are impossible, or if the couple um, deems that this, um, those avenues are impossible for them, um, or maybe the couple is advanced in age and they, they physically can't, um, can't have children or raise children anymore, they're still called to be a fruitful presence um, in other ways, through through their extended families, in their communities, in their parishes, to be a life-giving presence. Remembering still that marriage um, is, is always meant to be a reflection of God's love. And so it's called to bear fruit in many ways, primarily through children, but then also in the ways that the couple lives, um, lives in their community, lives in their extended family, lives in their parish, in the world. So again, marital love is free, is total, is faithful and is fruitful. If any of these are missing in a marriage, there's something, um, there's something wrong in the marriage. There's something that that should be corrected, because then uh, that couple isn't living God's plan for marriage, um, is creating distortions in their love. And in closing, I touched on this a little bit already, but there are two main purposes for marriage as understood. Um, in a Catholic perspective, as created by God. So again, remembering God is the author of marriage. We don't get to say what marriage is for. So the two main, two main reasons for marriage, the two main purposes of marriage, are one, the sanctification of the spouses, that the spouses are called to help one another grow in holiness. And what a great gift that is. Um, all the other sacraments up until the sacraments at the service of communion, so baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, reconciliation, anointing of the sick, are meant primarily for our relationship with God. When we come to the sacraments at the service of communion, holy orders, and holy matrimony, these sacraments are meant 
not only for our holiness, but for the holiness of others. So in the sacrament of holy matrimony, spouses are given special graces to help one another grow in holiness, to encourage each other on the race towards heaven. So the sanctification, the holiness of the spouses, that's the first purpose. And the second purpose, which I already alluded to, is for the um, bearing of offspring, the raising of offspring, to live as a domestic church, uh, to cultivate faith as a family. Um, again, most, um, most often through, through having children um, and raising children, uh, but also possibly through adopting children, fostering. Um, that's another, another way that the second purpose is lived out. So marriage is a great blessing to the church, is a great gift to the church. And I fully believe that if uh, Catholic couples um, with great eagerness, with great joy, uh, live the beauty of this vocation, um, seek to help their spouses grow in holiness, seek to, seek to help one another uh, grow closer to God, grow closer um, to, to God's, God's plan for marriage, and if Catholic couples seek to really instill a love for God, a love for the church and their children, we will revitalize the church and revitalize the world. Holy matrimony is, is not a walk in the park. Marriage is not a walk in the park. But it has extraordinary blessings, extraordinary graces for those who do discern this vocation.